on average, each year, 5,000 women, and some of them still girls, are murdered mostly by their families or their neighbors. Most of these occur in the Middle East or in South Asia, but there have been instances in most countries in the world. The question, of course, is why? Why would this happen? In the minds of those doing it, it is to defend the family's honor. You see, many of these women are murdered because they were the victim of a sexual assault. Rather than culturally and uh, legally going after the rapist, the criminal, the one who did this, the twisted culture, it's a combination of cultural and religious belief in most cases. This twisted belief ignores the perpetrator and takes out its anger, its vengeance on the victim. This is the same logic that to a lesser extent, uh, in many other cases, leads to what we call victim shaming. If a woman is the victim of a sexual assault, first thing some people think is, what was she wearing? Was she drunk? Where was she alone? And ask the questions of how was it that she got herself into this? That attitude is an old one that still persists. But it's the same logic, looking for the cause in the wrong place. Keep that in mind because it's a very close parallel, I think, to what Paul, or Paul, what Jesus is telling us here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. So we pick up the text. Remember the last two weeks we were talking about tradition. Verse 14, it says this, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Before we continue, we should probably make sure we're all on the same page. The word defile there is a synonym of impure, unclean, that kind of thing. So the last two weeks we saw Jesus talking about the need for both integrity and sincerity in traditions, in religious practices, in order for them to be effective. In order for them to be profitable for us, we need to approach them with sincerity. We need to not just be going through the motions, and we need to approach them with integrity, with morals as the basis. Now Jesus is going deeper, going to the, to, the, to the principles, to the foundation of the matter, to show that things like ceremonial cleanliness and the kinds of things like kosher laws or the, the observance of the Sabbath, those are, in the end, surface issues. They're not as significant as the things of the heart, and his reasoning for that we will get to eventually as we go through this. So what then are traditions and observances and the like if they are not sufficient to make a person clean or unclean, holy or unholy, pure or impure? If they don't have that power, what's the point? As you read, especially the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, you see that God gave the children of Israel a lot of them in the Law of Moses. Very detailed rules sometimes about what they could eat, about what they could do on the Sabbath, about what they should wear. There was a ton of those. Even in the New Covenant, there are still things somewhat similar to that, like baptism and communion. They remain part of God's working with his people, even though we've moved from law to grace. And so the question becomes, what's the value? What's the purpose? And this is sort of a conclusion of the last two weeks as well. And four things at least jump out to mind. Number one, they are opportunities to obey God. That is, in and of itself, has value. A chance to heed the instructions of God. A chance to do what God has said. I know your parents probably resorted, and you as a parent may have from time to time resorted to the answer, because I said so. It's good. I like it. It's a winner. Uh, especially when they're five and why becomes something they enjoy, or actually three uh, when that starts. So obedience has its own value. Secondly, 
These are actually easy steps in the right direction. These are a chance to win victories and have something to build on in a person's life. These are the easy things to do. These ceremonial things, these observances are the easy ones. Everything that we're talking about here, all of this kind of stuff is much easier than praying for those who persecute you, than loving your neighbors as yourself, than making sure that your thoughts are pure, not just your actions and your words. I mean, those are much harder. This is the easy stuff. So sometimes it's nice to have easy stuff. Thirdly, these are opportunities to build community, to witness to outsiders, to say these are kinds of the things that define who we are. This is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, is to be baptized and to take communion and to go and to worship and to pray publicly and all of the things that we do together. And then fourthly, just because something isn't life or death doesn't mean that it's unnecessary or unimportant. Many of the things in life that are secondary in value, they give it beauty, they give it joy, they give it a lot of uh, things beyond just purpose and meaning. The problem then in first century Judaism, the uh, situation that Jesus is confronting here, is that they overvalued these outward signs and they undervalued inward transformation. We're not trying to say that outward signs are meaningless. We just need to tip the scales back to where they belong. They are secondary. What happens in the heart is always the top priority. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here. Rebalance priorities and perspective. We continue. We get to verse 16, and you say, wait a minute, there is no verse 16. Uh, or if you have an older Bible, perhaps it's still in there in the King James. It is. Let me explain. It's a very simple thing. This is a textual variant, and we talk about these from time to time. This is the exact same phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear, as is in Mark chapter 4, verse 23. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said the same thing before he said this, and the copyist probably thought they forgot it. He said the same thing twice. And so they just repeated it. But it's not changing the meaning of this passage at all, if it's there or not there, because Jesus began by saying, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. He who has an ear, let him hear, is just a variation of that same theme. And I know, as a child, you need to be told three, four, five, six times because you weren't listening, and sometimes as a spouse that happens too. Uh, but really, the first time works. So Jesus says, listen up. So whether or not 16 belongs in the text doesn't matter, we're already listening, or at least we should be. Verse 17, after he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Now this is not a parable in the way that we normally think of them. What Jesus said about uh, what's on the outside and the inside is not like the parable of the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. Uh, so it's not one of those kinds of stories, but the word parable also applies to uh, ways of teaching that, that are symbolic, uh, that use analogies and allegories. So it's not just stories, so don't let that throw you. But there is a disconnect here. There's a disconnect between what the disciples have seen with their own eyes and what they've heard Jesus teach them. They've spent a good amount of time with him, and yet there's a disconnect between what they hear and see and what their hearts and minds can at this point comprehend and eternalize and grasp. They're still trying to process it all. And this is not the first time nor the last time that this slowness, that this hesitancy to accept God's truths is going to annoy Jesus. He's going to express some frustration with it. And one of the things that we sometimes do when we read the Gospels is shake our heads at the disciples and say, you guys are such knuckleheads. What a bunch of goobers. Come on, right? Before we get too far down that road, we should probably say, uh, ask ourselves a question, how quick am I to learn what God is trying to teach me? A am I quick at that, or am I uh, a little bit slow on the uptake too? Uh, so let's not get too hard on them, but it was difficult for Jesus to deal with that. He continues, 
Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out the body. Now, without being too technical, the digestive system is not connected to your heart, or your mind, or your soul, uh, or anything of that nature. It simply takes in nutrients and expels waste. I know it's more complicated than that, but that's the long story short. While how we act regarding food can reflect greed, it can reflect gluttony, we know that, right? Partaking or abstaining does not create holiness. It does not create defilement. Aside from issues of gluttony or greed, if, we, if it's not about that, then what you choose to eat, whether you eat uh, beef or chicken uh, or fish uh, or you something else, that's not an issue of holiness. It's not an issue of morality. It may be an issue of your health if your doctor said quit eating this, but that's a different thing entirely and not what Jesus is talking about here. So where does this idea come from? This is actually an idea that has a lot of uh, impact on church history. And I won't go into it very much, but monasticism, the monks and nuns, the, the, we call that movement monasticism, was built in part on the idea that if monks ate simple fare, uh, bread and, uh, well, nobody drank water then because it wasn't safe, uh, watered down uh, beer or watered down wine, uh, and if they wore basic clothing, uh, that that was, in a way, helping them uh, be more holy. That it made them more or, or closer to God than the average person. It was, it was their belief, it was the belief of the common people too. Uh, they gave monks and nuns quite a bit of respect uh, on that. And it wasn't cer certainly just what they ate, but also of course abstinence uh, from sexual activity, from married life uh, that they committed to as well. And so the church, uh, for a long period of time, for really about a thousand years, elevated the idea that if you ate uh, certain things, it made you holier. If you wore, wore certain clothing, it made you holier. Uh, and if you uh, remained uh, a virgin throughout your life and never got married, that it made you holier. That that was a path to being a step or two or so closer to God than anybody else could get. Uh, we call that idea asceticism. It's the idea that self-denial makes you holy. And sometimes that idea goes even one step further and goes to what we call mortification, the, the beating of your own body. Uh, there was a movement uh, that was in part concurrent with the Crusades uh, called, uh, with people that were called flagellants. And they would take whips and beat their backs bloody as a show of penance. And it actually became a huge movement and the church could not control it. They tried to stop it, and, and it like riots broke out. Broke out. Uh, so this was a, a movement in the history of the church that started to turn uh, in, against that and move away from that uh, in the generations leading up to and through the Protestant Reformation. But it's a big question. And you see that Judaism had some of these same ideas. Buddhism has some of these same ideas. Even uh, Islam has some of these ideas. It has a movement a whole strand that goes down this path. So it's not a unique idea that what you wear and what you eat and that kind of thing could make you holier. But that's not what Jesus said. So Mark comments on this. This is Mark's comment. He says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. The NIV puts it in brackets because they think that this is Mark's commentary and not Jesus. Uh, he, Jesus didn't say in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. It's the middle of the quote. Um, but Mark had a Gentile audience and they wouldn't have understood very well these kosher rules and whatnot that they were arguing about here. Part of the early church's need was to define how Gentiles can approach God through the gospel. 
Because the first generation, the first believers, were all Jewish Christians. They were all people who observed the law of Moses faithfully, for the most part, and then they accepted Christ. But then people like Peter had his uh, vision with Cornelius in Acts 10, 15, and we saw that, where God said to Peter, don't say anything is unclean if I say it's clean. And then the very moment later, people showed up to say, come to our house, an angel told us to send for you. And the people there were all Gentiles. And when Peter preached the gospel to them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And he realized that these people are not unclean, even though they do not keep kosher, even though they do not obey the Sabbath, even though they are not circumcised. And it was a revelation to him. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul deals with a similar issue when he's talking about meat offered to idols. And he says, whether you eat food that was, that was butchered as part of an idol worship, which much of the food in the Greek Roman, Greco-Roman world was, because meat was so rare and, so, and, and, and a luxury, much of it was involved in idol worship, Paul's explanation was that that doesn't actually change the meat. It's still just meat because the idol is just a piece of stone. It's not actually a false god. If it was really another god, then we'd have an issue here. And he goes and talks about that. Uh, We saw that similar passage in the book of Romans talking about that as well. The early church had to wrestle with this because they didn't know the answer. In Acts chapter 15, you get what's known as the Council of Jerusalem where Paul and others came to Jerusalem and met with Jesus' half-brother James and Peter and the rest, and they talked about it. And their answer was a resounding no. And that's a huge thing for the history of the church. The new covenant created by Jesus transcends the old. It frees those who accept the gospel by believing in Jesus from the ceremonial aspects of the law of Moses. In other words, if you are a Gentile believer, you do not have to be circumcised. You do not have to keep the Sabbath. You do not have to eat kosher and all of the things uh, that go with that. So this is Mark saying, here is the point in in the history where Jesus himself put his weight behind the idea that the church would eventually embrace. Jesus goes on to continue. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. Let's stop a minute uh, and and go on a parallel track. How many of you uh, had the uh, either joy or burden, depending on how you appreciated it, of reading Lord of the Flies when you were in high school? Lord of the Flies? Dennis, yeah, two, three, four. I wrote a paper in college about Lord of the Flies, and for several years I taught Lord of the Flies. I've got a copy that has notes everywhere and highlights everywhere. Uh, It's the kind of copy my students would have wanted to sneak uh, off my desk because it had all the answers to the test questions. Um, I'm a big fan of the story. And in the story, if you do not know it, the author William Golding was a World War II vet. And he had seen tremendous evil serving in the Pacific in World War II. And it made him ponder the question of where does evil come from? And so long story short, uh, he posits a story where a bunch of boys are uh, not shipwrecked because it was a plane, but plane wrecked uh, on an island, on a deserted island. And all of the adults are killed. And it's only a bunch of boys. They range from uh, elementary to upper middle school. And they're there together, and at first, it seems like a paradise. No parents, no school, no police, no rules. We can do whatever we want. But then something starts to happen. They become afraid that there is a beast hiding in the forest, in the jungle. And you can understand why the little ones would think that, because the strange jungle noises at night, little kids get scared of that kind of thing. But hopefully the middle schoolers would say, oh, come on, that's not real. But as the story unfolds, they believe it more and more. And the character of Simon realizes that there is no beast in the forest. And the key phrase that that unfolds his whole novel is, the beast is us. We brought any evil that is on this island with us. Because it did not have any until we got here. 
the birds and the lizards, they were all fine just living na in nature. There was no evil here until we got here. And as he runs out on the beach in a storm to tell them, don't be afraid, the lightning uh, scares the rest of the kids and they murder Simon. And not till the next day when the sun rises do they realize that it was not a beast we killed in the night, it was our classmate, our, our fellow school kid, uh, Simon. And the thing falls apart from there. By the end of the novel, the island is on fire and they're trying to murder each other. And William Golding's novel ends with a naval officer pulling up on beach and you, there's a warship in the distance. And he stands there and says, I thought you boys could have done better than this. You're British after all, you're civilized. But the irony, of course, is that the man's got a gun on his hip. He's a soldier. He's, the war is out there. <laughs> the evil was out there, too. Now, that might have been more about Lord of the Flies than you wanted, but if you're forced to read it someday, now you've got the key to it. See, I just helped you out. If it's, on, it's in your uh, future uh, there, kids. Uh, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. This is a fundamental truth of the Judeo-Christian worldview. Evil is not an external force. A number of religions believe that it is, like Zoroastrianism, which was a big deal in the early part of church history. That evil is a thing that is out there. A number of, of Star Trek episodes uh, talk about something like that, this force that's out there. But evil comes from beings that are in rebellion against God, from sentient beings that are in rebellion against God, whether those are demonic beings or human beings, it comes from beings. In both cases, it comes from within them when they choose to feel and think and do things that are evil. That's where evil comes from. In our science fiction, sometimes we think of evil as an external force, and I'll give you three examples at least. Vampires, werewolves, and zombies. All of those tales are about evil being something that you can be infected with. In each case, by being bitten by, you get this thing, and it turns you evil. But that is not the reality of the situation. Evil is not an infection. Evil is a choice. And I know that there is an asterisk for mental health. I know, I know that things like schizophrenia and whatnot, I'm not trying to, to parse out every single instance. But by and large, the evil that exists in our world happens because people choose to do it. Now, I know that that story is also complicated. When you think about an evil like racism, and you think about little kids, little kids are not born racist. You see all the time at the playgrounds, two and three year olds, four and five year olds playing with kids of another race, they don't think of it twice. A story from when I was a kid, my, my family and I, we, we drove in, in the car uh, all the way to Maine. Uh, three kids in the back seat, we lived through it, I don't know how, uh, but we made it. Uh, and in Maine, my little sister played on the beach with a French Canadian kid because it was just across the border at Old Orchard Beach and they sat and played together for a long time even though the one girl spoke French Canadian, you know, uh, and my sister spoke English. They had no problem bridging the gap of language. So where does that come from? It's obviously learned behavior. There's obviously an environmental influence from parents and from culture teaching kids that people that don't look and act and dress like you are somehow different. But ultimately, as we grow, as we mature, each person is responsible for whether or not they embrace or reject what they were taught. And that's true of every form of evil. Jesus says this, it is for it is from within, out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. 
I just mentioned uh, recently that I appreciate the show Law and Order. I used to watch it a ton of times. I've seen every episode so many times I stopped watching it. But one of the things that stuck with me was the first episode with the assistant district attorney, Jamie Ross, if you remember one of the early seasons. On her first day at the office, she tells her boss, Jack McCoy, I believe in monsters and things that go bump in the night. When he asked her, why did you join the prosecution? Because she used to be a defense attorney. And Jack's uh, response, of course, is, may they rot in hell along with their attorneys. She came to the prosecutor's side because she realized that evil was real from defending people that had done evil things. Some of you may know that I read the paper every day. When we go on vacation, I save them up and I put them in order and I read uh, and catch back up when I get back home. I have to. I do it. Uh, my grandmother did that. Uh, I, it's just one of my things. When you do that, read the paper every day, watch the news every day, you're reminded on a daily basis of the terrible reality of evil in story after story. In this last week, there were a number of them there was the, the boyfriend that murdered his girlfriend and all five of her kids, one of them was less than a year old, shot them all. We see stories like that day after day after day if you read the paper or watch the news or pay attention to it. Now there are some good stories in there too from time to time, but there is a steady drip of evil in the news and it will never go away. Why is that? Because that is what fallen humanity is. This is the reality of humanity apart from God. This is the reality that William Golding was trying to get us to understand in The Lord of the Flies. We bring it with us. We can't hide from it, we can't run from it. Even if you go and live by yourself in the desert, it's there because you brought it with you. We don't need ceremonial or ritual uncleanness to make human beings capable of evil. We have that already. As any parent of more than one child can tell you, nobody had to teach your kids how to fight. They figured it out on their own, did they not? They figured out things to fight about, and they figured out ways to torture each other, including, of course, the famous, stop touching me. I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, or why are you hitting yourself? Those are classic, and I enjoyed them as much as anyone, but nobody had to teach children to act that way. And if you have two or three kids that loved each other all the time, God bless you. Uh, uh, you're unique, and everyone else doesn't like you now. Um, but look at the list. Look at the list that Jesus gives us here. And notice something. He talked about slander. That's a form of gossip. That's gossiping when it's not true. So that gossip that you readily share and that time card that you fudge at work, there was greed in there, come from the same place that inspires the rapists and murderers. They all come from the same place place, the tainted, darkened human heart. The difference between the little light, white lie, that's a lovely phrase we use, the little white lie, because those ones are not such a big deal. The little white lie, and the biggest lie that I could think of, which would be the propaganda put forth by Goebbels that led to the Holocaust, where he convinced the German people that the Jews were nothing more than vermin. That's about the biggest lie, and it can incl included the blood libel. You should look that up, Google that. It was a huge, monstrous lie that led to millions of people being killed. So that's both ends of the spectrum. Those lies are different by degree, not kind, because evil is evil. And sometimes evil does a small harm Sometimes we do something that is evil and it does not seem to have made that big of an impact. And sometimes an evil choice leads to a raging forest fire 
that burns the place down. One of the things about evil is that you don't necessarily know which of those two outcomes you're going to get. All of that evil is a rebellion against the holiness and righteousness of God. It's all an act of defiance of our creator. And it all comes from the darkened human heart. Whether it's an individual doing it or a group of human beings acting collectively. So we know about bad influences and peer pressure uh, and mentoring, if it's the wrong kind of mentoring, some of the bad mentors. Those are very real. And, the, and they are certainly dangers to avoid, and they're dangers to protect people from, especially our children uh, and, and others. But they are not the source of the evil that results. It has to flow from the human heart. That's the only place that it can come from. So now you're thinking, are we going to have any good news here? That was depressing. Appreciate you sharing with us something quite so depressing. But there is good news. And let me tell you what it is. When you know the true cause of something, then you can fight against it. When you know where something is coming from and what, it is, what, and what is causing it, then you can actually try to change it. In this case, we are very fortunate because Jesus is both the doctor who has di diagnosed for us what the disease really is, and Jesus is the cure for that disease. Three thoughts of application uh, before we uh, begin communion, if you want to go get them. First one, the inside is more important than the outside. Jesus is telling us that this morning. Our hearts and minds are far more important than what happens on the outside. Secondly, recognizing the problem is the first step toward a solution. It's one of the things that AA believes, and it's absolutely true here. We need to know where it's coming from. And then thirdly, thankfully, Jesus offers freely to all by faith a transformed and renewed heart. At this point, we're going to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. I've got to shut this off. 